Hello everyone and welcome to the last, 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 last week of this course in theoretical perspectives and key ideas in anthropology. I find it incredible that we've reached the end of this course uh, this week. Um, what a journey it's been uh, for all sorts of reasons, not least this uh, kind of filmic <laughs> element to it. For me, that's been quite a new experience and for you also. Um, I think it's gone all right. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. You can be the judges of that. Um, in fact, this week you have the opportunity to be the judges of that because uh, I believe that the Opinio survey is being circulated this week. Uh, and that is your chance to give me uh, feedback or give the department as a whole feedback about this course, about my teaching, about all aspects, um, the content of the course. Indeed, the topic of today's lecture, which is uh, decolonizing, question mark. I don't know how to say that, decolonizing, decolonizing. <laughs> how does one add a question mark to just a word? Um, so in your feedback for the course, you can also very much um, speak about your, your, your thoughts from this aspect um, of um, the content of the course. Um, and this really is part of the context uh, in which I did make the decision to devote um, the final lecture to a kind of open-ended, question mark-led uh, discussion of this theme of decolonization of anthropology, uh, of the curriculum, and so on. Uh, this is a context that is very live in our minds uh, since the 2020 summer uh, which was such a kind of watershed moment, I think, in so many ways. Um, not least for your generation, but for all of us. Um, and I think I'll take a leaf out of uh, Donna Haraway and the question of situating oneself um, and being very clear about one's kind of positionality. Uh, also what Ash said in the conversation that we had last week on colonialism and how he thought that the most kind of appropriate way to approach um, these questions of colonialism and decolonization is above all from being very reflexive, critical, sensitive, thoughtful about the position that one is speaking from, the position of the people to whom one is speaking. Positionality is not just from the point of view of the person uh, writing or speaking, but also it's a relational uh, activity. Reflexivity is relational. You'll see more about that in the clips to follow. Uh, and it involves an awareness of um, positionalities, if you like, or situatedness in the plural. These are both horrible words, by the way, aren't they? They're kind of inventive words, but we know what we mean. And I think they're important words in this context, right? So um, I want to just say as context for the clips that follow, and a few things. Um, the first one is that for me, it's vitally important um, in presenting the history of social theory, anthropological theory, um, as this course has done in part. Um, it hasn't really been a history course, but it has had an element to that, as I've explained from the beginning. Uh, one should be thoroughly critical uh, in relation to these themes of the colonial heritage and continuation of that, the legacy of that, uh, the neo-colonial dynamics and so on in which anthropology, as so many, in fact, all activities perhaps, is embedded. Um, I think that's vitally important. I think it would be inexcusable to have a course that didn't do that. That's the reason why I chose to put these issues on the table from the very first week. And I think we've returned to them increasingly as week of, have, weeks have gone by. I've tried, as I said, to strike a balance between acquainting you with the conversation that is the development, this very rather narrow lineage of social cultural anthropology in the way that it developed in the colonial metropolises and then post-colonial metropolises. Uh, and that in, you know, since the 1970s, 80s has in a number of ways opened up and shifted and changed, but still in many other ways, um, and, you know, carries through this legacy and seeks, I hope, as this course has done, to problematize it also in different ways, right? There's, there's no real other option. Um, I mean, there is the option of abandoning the project because you feel that it's so tainted and that is something that exists as a, as a possibility. 
Um, that's not the option that I would want to take um, because I see enormous value in anthropology. I think, you know, I'm kind of evangelical, in fact, about the value of anthropology as being, if you like, it's the remedy for its own con colonial condition uh, to a very large degree. And the kind of um, uh, opening up of thought that anthropological thinking provides, uh, the sensitizing to thinking that the exposure and vulnerability um, to um, forms and ways of living um, that go beyond what one anticipates, I think has an enormously critical potential um, and has exactly the kind of critical potential that is called for when addressing the kinds of questions of colonialism, neocolonialism and decolonization that we've been discussing in these two last weeks of the course. That is my own position. Uh, that is how I feel. That is why I continue to be in love, frankly, with anthropology, because I think it is an incredibly powerful um, um, way of, of really overturning uh, structures of thought um, that are imbricated also in this uh, colonial situation that we're discussing. Talking about positionality, I'm almost tempted to uh, bring into the camera my four-month-old, four-and-a-half-month-old daughter so I can introduce you to her because I'm aware that she's been a kind of uh, bit player in the clips that I've been recording. It's impossible to record clips at home uh, where I'm stuck uh, um, you know, in a two-bedroom flat, which is the situation in which I live without hearing the baby crying. So um, I won't apologize for it because I have no option and her voice is lovely anyway. <laughs> so, but I, was, I almost thought I should kind of bring her and say, hey, this is Leela. Uh, you know, this is my daughter. Since we've, we've been together now for, you know, uh, nine, ten weeks and, you know, it, it does feel like you're kind of, we're connected, right? We're, we're, we're all going through this experience together. So anyway, I'm not going to do it because her mother's feeding her. <laughs> but um, I was thinking about doing it just as a kind of extra bit of personal positionality. Um, okay. Maybe also because I'm just so proud of, you know, it's my first kid. And I'm quite, I'm an old dad, so I'm kind of a bit silly about these things. So maybe it's a bit cringe. Sorry about that. <laughs> anyway. So another thing that I wanted to say about positionality um, is, again, with reference to that conversation with Ash last week, which I thought was really great. I really love talking with Ash. Um, is um, we, Ash mentioned the difference between between uh, the kind of way in which I presented uh, anthropology and its lineage, you know, in a kind of purifying, simplistic way, because I'm giving a lecture, obviously things are always much more complicated than you can convey in a lecture, but anyway, and post-colonial studies and the other, and how those things were in conversation with each other. And Ash said, well, listen, you know, when I studied at SOAS in the early 2000s, that wasn't a distinction that we made anymore. You know, those two things were completely intertwined, right? Now, I want to make clear that I didn't study at SOAS. Um, I studied in two of the departments um, that are really part of that kind of very um, lineage-oriented uh, trajectory of British social anthropology. I did my master's at the LSE and my PhD in Cambridge. Um, and both of those departments, um, you know, very interesting, important, fascinating teachers that I had and really, really privileged in so many ways, I'm really privileged in all senses of the word, to, uh, to have studied in these places. Uh, but it's definitely true um, that there is a, a kind of sense of lineage uh, and of it's almost like, um, not purity, I don't, I don't think that would be exactly right, but uh, a sense of ancestry that one feels responsible to when, when one is kind of educated in those institutions. Um, my personal lineage, I think I probably mentioned this in a lecture already, is, you know, I'm the great-grandson of Malinowski. <laughs> How does that work? Well, my supervisor for my PhD was Caroline Humphrey. Um, her supervisor for her PhD was Edmund Leach. And Edmund Leach's supervisor for his PhD was Bronislaw Malinowski. <laughs> so that's the lineage. Right. Um, at the LSE, I was supervised by Maurice Bloch, um, the Marxist and more recently cognitive-oriented anthropologist that, you've, that we've encountered on this course. Well, he's the great-grand-nephew of Emile Durkheim via Marcel Mauss, whom he remembers as a child having met. Um, so there's a kind of almost an endogamous kind of 
thing about anthropology as a bit of a clan conversation and so on, which um, Ash was saying, you know, you can't afford really to continue teaching anthropology in that way. You've really got to open it up. And I really, really agree with him on that. And while agreeing with him on that, I also think that those conversations developed through those lineages and so on, and those kind of uh, thoughts about how, you know, um, field work, uh, exposure to other people's lives, both abroad and at home as anthropology developed. I mean, many, many decades ago, uh, uh, Raymond Firth, one of the, a person who's famous for his work among the Tikopia people in the Pacific, also did research in London. Um, you know, so a lot of these things go a long way back. So uh, rendering yourself open and vulnerable um, and kind of able to shift your own thinking in relation to other people's thinking, wherever, wherever they may live, and whatever... Um, you know, kinds of social uh, situations they engage in and so on, um, is very much part of that conversation that uh, this project of anthropology sought to develop. Um, so for me, this conversation ab about decolonization is pursued from the position of a person who is thoroughly kind of, I have that lineage in my anthropological DNA, if you like, I have all of those reference points in my head. That's why, you know, I'm able also to teach a theory course because I'm very familiar with some of these currents because I kind of grew up with them, if you like. My, my brain expanded in relation to them, if you like. Um, so I speak from that position. But I speak from a position also, uh, and this is really relevant to the summer of 2020 that I referred to earlier, of a person who agrees wholeheartedly with Ash that the value that I see in that uh, in that engagement that I that I had a, as a student and as an anthropologist developing, and to which I've sought to contribute in my own work, and I'll explain a bit more about that uh, um, clips to follow, um, needs to be uh, um, calibrated and brought into you know a consistent and concerted dialogue with the kinds of questions that we were discussing last week. Um, and to pursue that uh, in oblivion uh, of those questions or, or being oblivious to those questions will consign anthropology to oblivion. Um, I have no doubt about that. I think Ash was absolutely right uh, to say that. Um, so in that, I'm entirely in agreement. And what that means is that I'm personally also in a process, as I always have been, but particularly now, of shifting my, my thinking is not settled. I don't have a clear um, and, uh, you know, settled opinion or position on all of the questions that we're discussing. Um, I'm much more in listening mode than I am in preaching mode um, at this point in my life as a teacher and so on. And that explains the question mark in the title of that I give into this to today's uh, lecture, the colonizing question mark. I'm kind of inhabiting that question mark. And I'm actually just as interested in hearing uh, your views in the Q&A, in, as I said, in the feedback and so on, and your thoughts. Um, always respectfully, I hope, always engaging in a, in a spirit of collaboration rather than attack and finger pointing and so on. I don't, uh, well, yeah, it's, it's your choice how you wish to approach things. But uh, anyway, um, my view is that, you know, where actually collegiality and care for each other has to be the basis for, for being, you know, very critical and um, etc. Calling things out um, respectfully, I think, is, is the right way to go, right? So absolutely, I want to hear these things from you. I want to hear your thoughts because my own thoughts are in motion. <laughs> I'll talk a little bit more about Truth in Motion, which is the title of one of my books um, in a later clip. Um, and let me just say something finally about that, and I'll close. This is, a, I think, the longest introduction I've ever given uh, to a lecture that I'm about to give, so sorry about that. Uh, precisely because I'm in listening mode, um, uh, I have chosen to uh, devote the largest part of this lecture to just presenting a very specific, particular take on this question of decolonization that comes from my own positionality, the positionality that I just described earlier, and that does not engage um, uh, or rely on, rather, it does engage with, but it does not rely on 
uh, or promote necessarily many other ways in which the project of decolonization is being articulated at the moment. Uh, I'll explain more about that in the next clip, um, but I just want to say as, as part of this introduction that I've chosen very deliberately to put on the table in this lecture, rather than try and kind of encompass all the different senses and issues um, that can be addressed through this question of decolonization, to present just one line of argument in which I've been very deeply involved myself and which I think is very relevant in a very specific sense to the question of decolonization, which I also think is particularly relevant to a theory course, because it really, as we shall see, concerns primarily the decolonization of anthropological thinking, how to shift the bases of thought that I think inform also uh, the colonial uh, uh, colonialism as a project, and forms of thought that are themselves colonial, how to begin to undo the dynamic of that. That's really the level at which I'm going to be addressing the question of decolonization today, being fully aware that that is perhaps not the level that you would like to address the question of decolonization. I'll say a little bit more about that in the next clip. Um, but that's basically the approach that I'm taking because I want to put the table on the table, you know, what I feel I have to contribute from my own positionality um, as a partial contribution to this conversation, uh, being very aware of the critical uh, difficulties with what I have to say. And in the final clip, I'm going to make that clear like I always do. Um, but, um, as an invitation then for you to think about how far uh, that perspective that I'm articulating uh, is uh, uh, one that you think is relevant, one that you think needs to be supplemented, displaced, criticised and so on from other perspectives that can also be taken on this debate. So I'm kind of opening this up uh, and actually I'm opening it up just by putting a little bit of myself uh, forward and, and putting that up for, for discussion. Good, I'm going to leave it there and I'll see you in the next clip.